James, do you mind helping me out a little bit? It's very simple. What if I told you you read the, the, the first line wrong? <laughs> Thank you. How do you guys feel about reading this much text on the page? Um, you are now Morgan Freeman. Relax, take your time. Read this in your new awesome voice. Seriously. I really like this last bit, how he says A sentence that burns with energy and builds with all the impetus of a crescendo The roll of the drums, the crash of the simple sounds That say, listen to this, is important I did a recent survey of 500 Australian web users, Android users Five, uh, out of 500 people, 200 skipped stuff, 175 scanned the page, 80 actually read content word for word, and 40 people just read the headline and moved on. This guy did that same research in 1997, nearly two decades ago, and he's come to the same statistics that we did. We had 15.9% of people who actually read everything, he had 16%. Amazing. The fact that nothing has changed in nearly two decades and what we didn't learn as a blogging community, as writers, as web publishers is that people don't read online and we write like they do read but when we read, we read very different to how we write. I asked for follow-up questions to the group that said, oh, I just keep bits and look for pieces of interest. I don't really read the whole article. I ask them why. I'm looking for quick answers. It's too long. I can't be bothered. I lose interest halfway down the page. I didn't like the design, the words, the structure. The text was too complex. I didn't really trust this website. I wrote a massive article that was quite successful about Google Plus and it had this many words, this many shares, it's like by far my most successful post. It earned some really, really sweet links, all natural. Time required to, to read this was 25 minutes. Can you guess the actual time on page on average? I was, yeah, that's in my analytics, I can see that. So, on average, people consume 25% of my content. Bounce rate is 89%, what's the book? bounce? Yeah, it's not that important, but they could read the page and move on to something else on, or bounce back to search results. But look at this. Number of visitors reading about, you know, less than half a minute on a page. Half a minute on a page, one minute, two to three minutes. Remember, it takes 25 minutes to read my article. I'm actually impressed, like some people say, like I'm thinking that's like an, an error in analytics, they just left the page on. <laughs> but that's very depressing for somebody who's put so much work into an article. I wrote this article, I was writing it for two months. Scanners, headliners, scanners, skippers, readers. But what I found is that people who read my content in more detail, who engage with my content a little bit better, are more likely to mention, quote, and link to it. We all know that links help rankings in Google. 
So my mission was to minimize interruption while reading, provide quick answers, support easy scanning of a page, improve trust and credibility, offer in-depth information retrieval, enable interactivity and personalization. I did this, well, let's, let's look at a normal uh, page layout format. You've got some external links, you've got some uh, content chunks, some media maybe. And this is what I did. I crunched my entire article into its skeletal form. And I just said the essentials. I, I use the principle of uh, inverted pyramid that journalists use. So say the most important things at the top, and provide some background information next, and at the bottom, give all the miscellaneous information that may or may, may not be of essential interest to the reader. Except, the, the inverted pyramid I chopped off the bottom. I didn't even show them, at the end of the article, any of the background information, like how did I come to certain conclusions. What I did instead, is any external content, instead of sending people out to external pages, I embedded the content within the page, and I was hiding bits and pieces of my content behind a clickable link. So that can turn into this. And you choose which part to expand. So when you click on a link, a certain block of text expands. So you may choose to read 75% of my content instead of 100, and that's cool, because you already got your answers in a skeletal form of the article. So I developed a little plugin to call it Hypertext. It just works as basic short code, where I put the uh, target anchor text and I, and I decide where I'm going to expand the... It's kind of like accordion, but not quite. It's kind of like a tooltip, but not quite. It's, this is something that fits me, and I couldn't find it, so I made one. Well, not me, my developer did. Um, so how, here's how it works. So that's the article. Maybe a few you know, sentences at the end or at the top. But basically, when you click on the link, you expand a chunk of text, and users can choose to read more, but if they don't want to, they can just trust the statement that you made without any support information. That's the format. Um, you can download the plugin, test it out. I've installed it on my site, but you didn't break it yet. Um, so uh, give it a test, see how it works. Uh, that's the URL, you can just Google WordCamp Brisbane, and it's right there on the first page of Google. Um, that's the content that worked for me in the past. So these are the types of content that really worked well, and these are the content qualities <laughs> which matched with that type of content, created my linkable assets. And that's, that's worked really nicely. So I did a little bit of study on my own uh, stuff that I've uh, written in the past and some of my other guys. And I found that evergreen content, like SEO for multi multilingual e-commerce websites, call to action examples, this stuff was found a lot in search results, but it didn't um, earn any links. It, it earned a lot of traffic. Uh, controversial stuff, news, things that I broke like as news first, that tends to get a lot of links. That's me. That's liquid nitrogen dewer, 3D printer. Um, I play with super, type 2 superconductors and uh, neodymium magnets. I make them levitate above or below the magnets. I make uh, really cool little demos and I'm in the progress of work, working on a little hoverboard. It's meant to happen this year, right? Remember? <laughs> so making it happen. It, it actually works. I, but the, the downside is it has to be like minus 200 and something degrees. But it's, it's pretty cool. All right, I'll stop with jokes now. Um, so science is not of my interest. That's the whole point of me showing you these things. Um, and in 2009, I got a link on this page as one of the supporters of the um, Year of Science. Right? So do follow a link. I'm not really supposed to do that. It says to put no follow on paid links. Um, but I thought, to hell with it. It's, it's, it's my passion. It's science. You know, I'm going to get a link there. I'm going to support this organization because I love science. So Ahrefs, Majestic, Moses, Open Site Explorer. People go and scan my backlink profile. Ooh, they made a new link. Let's go to that page and let's buy some uh, more sponsorship on the same page and ruin the, uh, the authority of that page. Australian SEO companies, their clients, I'm, and I'm, the, the, the science lady, she was like, hey Dan, suddenly we're getting like tens of thousands of, uh, you know, uh, in support. Thank you so much. I don't know what happened, but suddenly everyone's paying us money. Um, philanthropists, all the SEO companies are. Oh. So I'm thinking there's one trillion URLs on the web and 0.4 trillion stars in our galaxy. These guys peak to get a link on my freaking page to ruin that link for me. Obviously, I'm a little bit upset, but I'm like, okay, determined. I'm gonna create links nobody can copy. And Dwayne Forrester from Bing sent, 
said, you want links to surprise you. You should never know in advance when a link is coming or where it's coming from. Web design Brisbane in a photo of your client's website. <laughs> I'm going to be creative, so I, let's go. Send people money. So what I did, I harvested Google's uh, search uh, results and I was looking for PSP numbers and bank accounts. And I sent everyone one cent. This is an actual from my statement. The thing is that everyone sees this in their statement too. The printer statement, so I'm targeting accountants, bookkeepers, business owners. It's essentially, I'm like kind of being, like, I invented bank account spam. For once, for, for like, for like one dollar, I can target hundred accountants. That's pretty cool. Um, but then I got in trouble. Um, <laughs> the uh, Commonwealth Bank manager uh, called me up and said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, it's a marketing experiment. She's like, can you please stop that? This other company complained, thinking that you're doing the Nigerian scheme, probing the bank account to see if you can extract money out of them. <laughs> okay. This other company asked, uh, said that they lost $700 staff time consolidating, reconciling the whole thing. <laughs> they asked for my, my bank account details so they can transfer the one cent back. <laughs> wow, never occurred to me. All right, so I scrapped that idea. So I started figuring out how can I get links from mirrors? Mirrors are juicy, right? So we started posting, uh, I don't even know what that is. Something to do with mail? Email? Yes, maybe. Um, so we hosted this uh, stuff and we got a massive amount of link and authority. There's the link there. So this is the postfix, page ring seven. Yeah. What? Melbourne? Suddenly? Like, like this is like a couple of weeks after. Our competitor. As soon as more competitors get links, I don't want to link there anymore because th it's a liability now. Um, again, woo, they made a link. No. Nah. Killed the mirror. All the links dropped off. But we noticed something interesting. All the stuff we had we started ranking for as a canonical version for all the research papers that we hosted, we noticed that Google started switching our domains to what used to be our research paper. And this, this has like uh, citations and it's like proper research papers. They took our version as canonical. I'm like, wow. So this led to our page rank uh, uh, hijacking or page hijacking maneuver, which Happened a couple of years back at a hijack Ram Fishkin's page, um, with his permission, of course, caused a lot of uh, turmoil in the SEO industry. Um, I got to see everyone's links in my Google Webmaster tools instead of their own, um, and then I got penalized. So, <laughs> scrap that. BitTorrent. I thought, how can I boost my content? How can I send my content out there? So, what I did, I zipped up, uh, I PDF'd all my articles. I wrote some 200,000 words over the last couple of years. I'm a prolific blogger. Um, so I made a PDF out of each article that I had, and what I did is signed up for Mini Nova. Remember we used to uh, download pirated movies from Mini Nova? Well, now they're uh, legitimate; they're all white hat, and you can only submit original content. So I did, but the thing is that they've got like millions of monthly visitors still. They've got that user base. So signed up for an account as a distributor of content. Um, set up my uploads, I've got a homepage exposure, category exposure, I could download and distribute it myself, so I was one of the seeders. And suddenly, that's the content downloads. I've got a link from each and every single one of them. So I thought, that's pretty cool, but hang on, this is all going to my CDN. This one got a lot of impressions, a lot of traffic, and it earned, it earned a lot of natural links through distribution and other means. Am I getting any value from this? So I did some research and Matt Cuts basically said PDF, PDF, links within PDFs, if, even if you link back to his website, they don't pass any page rank. It's like a no follow. Check out the John Mueller statement, Webmaster Trends Analyst from Zurich. Yep, only HTML links uh, pass page rank. A little bit of theory, node, edge, link graph, eigenvector centrality, who links to whom, and that's how the authority is determined. PDFs are not part of that. They're called dangling nodes. So I went through a research paper after research paper after research paper after research paper, and they all say the same thing. I wrote to one of the researchers who basically said she couldn't, she, you know, we don't know what Google does, but I can confirm PDFs like PNGs and other stuff, SVGs are considered dangling nodes. Any links you earn, to your PDF content, don't count. Remember all the like hundreds of thousands of uh, 
impressions and all the links I got, well, all right, so uh, uh, we set up a little test to see if we can fix this. That was the test page, the mystery PDF. Uh, we set up uh, one of our old brochures and we made a, a HTML version and we used the HD access file to um, write the canonicalization in the header. So that's the format. You can download this slide later on. I'm not going to go through the details. And what happened is it switched in the service. It wasn't showing the PDF anymore. It was showing our HTML file now. And any links in, containing that HTML file, we're going to transfer that page ring through to re the rest of the site. Now, CDN dropped. Um, and we started uh, seeing some uh, impressions for our main website. So afterwards, all that PDF stuff was equal to our, because HTML does pass page ring. So, um, all these naturally earned links and everything else, because we're not supposed to be building links, but earning links now, they're free, they're passive, and they're copy proof. They're very difficult to replicate. I've actually used this technique and I've reclaimed 109 linking domains to my link profile. So Google says you're not supposed to be building, buying links. No, uh, but if you pay Dan to uh, build some links for you, even if he does it nicely, what, what, what then? So I asked John Miller from Google, he says, well, it's not the case I'd have a lot of people go out there and beg for links for you. That's not really cool. Um, and I said, well, what if, what if you pay a marketing company to do PPC and display and go, no, 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 and you create this multi-channel bars and you get links at the, at the end anyway? <laughs> so I, I jumped on Outbrain. Outbrain is, uh, for, for those who are not familiar, um, uh, at the end of each article I say on CNN, at the bottom of that article you see remote stories. That's basically paid content amplification. So I used this. Um, this was a little campaign that we did. Uh, I, I generated eight unique domain links. Four text links, one image link, three were no follow. That's pretty cool. So I bought impressions and clicks and the links happen on an organic level. So for this to work, you have to have an awesome piece of content to start with. This is just a good amplification method. So. Um, one of the other t uh, effective tactics that I employed was most people go write a piece of content they're like, hey everyone, look what I wrote, who cares, right? All the influencers, those people who are ho you're hoping they will share that content, they're not going to share it because they're not interested in it. So what I do is I do outreach before the content exists. I reach out to experts for their opinion, for a quote, for data verification. I sometimes include uh, Influencers work with sometimes with ego bait. You can start the little interview. Once you publish the content that has them embedded in it, that tends to work a little bit better for link generation. So we did this a long time ago with um, the making of this video. Giant stars compares. You know, you've seen this. You know, oh, we're so small. Um, so what I did, I went to Google and I researched uh, some of my targets and I found a good one. Cornell University. Of course, you would you would want to get a link from Cornell.edu. So I contacted this lady for um, uh, for facts. She gave me some facts to improve the quality of my video, to, so I'm not getting all of all the um, astronomical facts wrong. When I published the video, it had credits with you know thank you so much for you know collaborating on this video. It wouldn't have happened without you. And suddenly, link from Cornell.edu. So people say, well, what if you do all this and it doesn't work? So what? You got a great piece of content, it's well referenced and it's well researched and it's all, it's all good. Worst case scenario, you've got a great piece of content behind you. So finding influencers is kind of a, a big job. If you really want to get great links and if you want to really pin these people in the content generation process, I'm not going to go through all these. They're just all great. So I use one of these tools to determine who two of my influencers. So that's my social following. This is theirs. So they're much stronger than me as personas online. Darren Rouse and Laura Papworth. Um, how do I reach out to these people? Crystal. Anyone using Crystal here? No? One. Awesome. You've got a secret weapon nobody else does in this room. Um, ben Rock, a technology journalist, investigative journalist, somebody that I want to pitch to. Um, I actually looked up Bronson as well. I'll see if it, How much time do I have? You have. Not enough. Uh, Bronson is creative, influencer, forward-thinking, ambitious, easily distracted, and makes quick decisions that can be unpredictable. When speaking to Bronson, use self-deprecating humor. Don't take, uh, don't act like you take yourself too seriously. Emphasize the future. Blah blah. When emailing Bronson, use an emoticon. Write with short, casual language and abbreviations. Does that make sense? Some of it. Some of it. It says it's. It says it's 45% confident in you. 
So with some other people, it'll, it'll have a high level of confidence. With some people, it'll have lower. But why am I showing you this? You know, you get to find out all the information and your relationship. This is the cool part. It has a Chrome extension, so you're writing an email to somebody that you want to really appeal to, like you're doing outreach for SEO purposes or content purposes. It says, um, I have three suggestions. It's kind of like spell check. Your email kind of sucks. You have three things to fix. Instead of saying, I wanted to ask you, just ask the question. Ben is direct, blunt. Don't beat around the bush with this guy. So once you fix all the things, stylistically and with our approach and style, um, we can tell you what to say, what to avoid. Um, it, can give you a, it gives you a sample uh, email to send. Once you've fixed up the style of your email, so it's a good job and you can then send your um, email. Kind of work. I didn't hear, I heard from Dan Rouse, I didn't hear from uh, Laurel Patworth. So we'll see what happens with this, but it's an awesome, awesome tool. Really works for collaborative as well. Like if you have a big organization that you work with, how to, how to best reach to your manager. So, you're all recycling. Um, if I run events every year, if I go and speak at different events each year, I just have SMX. I don't put SMX 2014, 15. Why? Because all the social signals and all the links go to the same page. So next time the new event's on, I can get um, a higher ranking for their event as well. Why do you want to get high rankings for an event name? Well, more, more chances of getting shared and getting links. So SEO Oktoberfest, SEO Munich, SEO Bootcamp, uh, SNX Sydney, these are all the times where I earn link to that same page rather than splitting up that effort into multiple pages. Um, so there's the page, there's the official website. That was the first non-branded result in the search results. That's good. iPhone does the same thing. They don't have iPhone 6 in there. They just have a, a URL called iPhone. So we have a, a Sydney page. That's our money landing page for Sydney uh, searches. Um, and we have a, an event running and what we did, we put the event registration form uh, on this page instead of creating a new one. So when we're sharing and promoting this event, our money landing page is being shared. So I did the same thing with WordCamp Brisbane um, and in, within eight minutes it did a fetch, fetch uh, with, um, as Google and submit to index. Thanks to the uh, uh, QDF. Uh, it got very quick because it was a fresh result. We, I used event schema to make my result a little bit more interesting and I made a cool call to action saying exclusive bonus material from Dan's Creative SEO talk. Um, some of the link lubricators, it, it helps when you're trying to earn yourself some links. It helps to have a brand, it helps to have a personal brand as well. Um, but out of all these things, there's, a, there's another element. Because um, once you build a reason for links to happen naturally, you never have to uh, worry about link building again. But, with a little nudge here and there. So one example of what I call a nudge is link to your own content from your own biography, for example, from your own content. Why? Because conference organizers swipe this whole thing and paste it in their uh, material. Ooh, 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 I got a link there. Uh, Aleda Solis didn't get a link. Grant Fishkin didn't get a link. Kasper Zimanski didn't get a link. I got a link. <laughs> For this conference, it was a, people were a little bit more savvy. But it's embarrassing. SMX is an SEO conference, and nobody uh, thought of that. Um, we know how Kogan got a link for. Do you remember when he did the Internet Explorer tax? Is that you know some of you? Yeah, because it's harder to build a website for IE, so he just added tax. This actually, he says, I don't do any SEO. He does. Look, he made uh, a thousand backlinks from 387 domain, uh, referring domains through media exposure, through creating turmoil. I use post-purchase enthusiasm on the checkout pages. Um, my email signatures are links. Links in presentation material, obviously with the UTM, so you know where it's coming from. Basically, all marketing material, think about embedding links in all these things. Sometimes people will mention you online, they will display your logo, you can do a reverse logo, um, reverse image search, look for your logos, mentions. You can reclaim a lot of links or what could be links as well. One of my other, run some time. You've got six minutes. <sighs> okay, hopefully I get through this. Um, rejuvenating your old content. Sometimes I'll spot in analytics, a page is really popular. A lot of people landing on it, but they're bouncing of it as well. And this page would have earned a lot of links if it was up to date and if it was really good. So I look for really popular pages. I fix them up. I make them 2015 or 2011, and they suddenly start earning links. Boring product pages, what do you do? Create a competition, but don't create a separate competition page. Just like I did with the Sydney event, hash competition, 
and it opens a new tab and you can have the rules of the competition and you can announce the winners on that same page on a boring product page and watch it get distributed. Crowdfunding campaigns, there's a whole list in, um, in Wikipedia of where you can uh, tap into. So if you have a product and somebody's doing something awesome on Kickstarter, reach out to them and say, let's talk, I want to interview, I want, I want to promote your uh, Kickstarter campaign, help you raise funds. You, find, you have to find a kind of a Goldilocks zone, not a celebrity sort of a Kickstarter campaign, but not somebody too small, somebody in the middle, because these people will link back to you and they will share it with their followers, Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus, um, if you engage them, if you promote them, so you can kind of leverage of their social following as well. In the media, look, we have a media page as well. We brag if we get mentioned in some significant places. So you can find places that mention uh, those who mention them. And you can mention them and tell them that you mention them. And that's how you get a link. This is a little bit, this kind of like pushing it. Um, what I also do is I do relationship mind mapping, you know. Who, who, who is my cleaning company? Do they have a website? Can I give them a testimonial? Will they link to me in that way? So some of the tools that I've built, um, I realized that Google is seen as this AI thing. I spoke to one of the Googlers. They build their algorithm manually. It's not self-learning. Bing is, Yandex is, Neighbor is, Baidu is. Google is manually patched up. It's like patches after patches. Um, and we can see this through algorithm. We built a little tool that looks at volatility of search results and expresses. So when something goes wrong with your website's organic traffic, you can see if it correlates with an event at Google and not something you did. Ooh, I changed my background color to blue, so I dropped in rankings, correlation, causation sort of issues. Uh, so we leverage this tool by not promoting the tool, but by doing a daily update segment on our website using API access, which you can also get as well, uh, for the tool data, putting the data on our website, making commentary and linking that and sharing that so it gets social media traction. Our other um, uh, tools that we built for Chrome and for WordPress, we've leveraged to promote our other content. Um, we even created a little framework to simplify that process. So CopyLink is one of them. Um, so this has a lot of, uh, a lot of downloads and we're promoting our new content uh, through this plugin. Flame is another tool that uh, generated a lot of uh, links. So I'm saying tools are content. Tools are linkable assets. You, if you release tools out there, they will earn you some links. This one works on, uh, obviously, validation of the uh, alternate hreflang markup. Um, and the one I'm pretty excited about is uh, Freshlink Finder, which looks to your server log files and or JavaScript uh, embedded on your site, kind of like analytics. Or you can go through analytics and suck out all the referrer traffic that your website's received. Creates a database and alerts you every time a new link is generated. So I log onto this every day and I, and I check out when a new link is created. The freakiest thing about this is not only that I'm getting uh, you know, great links and problematic links and I can be proactive about who's linking to me, but I can see when somebody's linking to me before they've uh, published a page. So if somebody's in the draft, doing the preview, clicking on the link to see if it works, I see it in my dashboard and I can email them and say, hey, I can see you're writing about me. Would you like a quote? Do I need to send you any material? And they're like, whoa, what just happened? <laughs> but this information is your law file. So obviously, you wouldn't want to do that manually. So I've, I'll build these little tools that can um, do this. You can also tell you the most linked pages on your website and the top referral traffic. So we've got a dev version as well. You can check out. It's got a bit more functionality, but it's a little bit more unpredictable as well. Um, and I've got like minus one minute. Maybe five minutes bonus time. Oh, thank you, Brunson. <laughs> uh, because I'm, I, I like this one. I'll try to, I'll try to um, be quick with this one. So, phrase potential calculation basically works out, well, people can search from all sorts of platforms and all sorts of locations, and there's also things that influence uh, one's rankings. So, in SEO industry, there is no such thing as ranking number one or ranking number three anymore. Ranking number one for whom? For, for what location, for what device, for you know, uh, which country? So we've got averages. Google's also encrypted all the queries, so we don't know, and, and the keyword clustering and all sorts of funky things, and we know that long tail keywords convert really well. But we don't get those keywords in our own data, so we have to use Google Webmaster Tools. Um, so we download the data from Webmaster Tools, which has position, click-throughs, impressions, and clicks. We know the keyword, and we don't know the landing page for this one. So ask these questions. What phrases have good search volume? How well do I rank for those phrases now? What is my average click-through rate for when I'm in search results? Can I rank the result above me? How much more traffic would I get? And what financial impact would it have? 
So you may have seen these studies, they're all BS because they're all different. These stats are different for every website. In fact, they're different for every keyword. So a little exercise, I've got two products. I'm trying to decide which one I should push and which one I should put my marketing effort into, which one I should be writing for, which one I should be blogging about. So this one has more impressions. They have the same amount of clicks, obviously the click to rate is double here. The average position is 9.4, average position is 4.2, same price, same conversion rate. Which one would you push? Next is seven or tab three? Nexus? Makes more sense. Yeah. So it's all about the potential. So I have a look. So at position four, I'm getting 18%. But in this specific instance, my click through rate was 10%. So can I jump to 22% if I move to position three? No, I can't. I have to lower my expectation on the basis of its current rankings. So we make that adjustment and we can create Phrase potential, this one will get 200 extra clicks, this one will get 500 extra clicks on the basis of the click through averages we know for the site, adjusted with the phrase average itself. Is this now an easy choice? Still? Yeah, are we forgetting one bit? Which is, what if the result above you is Wikipedia? What's the potential then? Then the potential is zero. Because you can't be Wikipedia for a generic term, right? So if you're trying to outrank Apple for iPhone, it's not going to happen. So, here's a screenshot. Can this guy move one, one up? Maybe. Can this one? For Nexus 7? Mm. You don't want to do this research manually. It's really tough. So what we do is, out of Moz or um, Majestic SEO, we get the keyword difficulty, we get the phrase difficulty parameter. They provide this by an API. So you can suck this data out, and you can see how authoritative the page above it is, what you can do then is create your own little uh, formula, simple formula, that merges the potential, click potential, and the difficulty score, and you can make your own. So this one looked good, but the, the result above it was, was too difficult, so we lowered the potential score, and we created a high potential score for this one, although it didn't look um, as good in the first place. So we can embed the uh, Google AdWords data, Keyword Planner, and other sources to get the non-ranking keywords into this report, and we can create, we can sort all our phrases top down from what we'll think will bring us the most money if it converts to the uh, one that will bring the lowest amount of money. Um, after this is some dirty tactics. Um, only for entertainment purposes, don't do this uh, at home or the office, please. Um, you can talk to me about at the uh, happiness bar, I'm happy to share this. So the slides are there, we can search Google for it. Thank you. I just want to know, have you had any word from Google about whether they fixed that canonical issue where you can see the other people's links? Uh, there's nothing to fix. No? There's nothing to fix, that's how it works. That's how, it works. That's how Google is designed. I actually, uh, yeah, I actually did speak to them. They said it's not, it's a, it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, but if, you, if you think about it, if you think about it, <clears throat> if, how does Google know who's first publishing the content? They just go about whatever's got highest page rank, which we don't see PageRank anymore. PageRank that we see in Toolbar is now like two years old nearly. So um, they're saying, yeah, uh, we just determine what the original source is. Even if you publish the first, if a big website comes along and scrapes your content, they'll be seen as the original, you'll be seen as a copy. And extra kick, all your links will be inverted into their link profile as well. That's just, yeah, that's just how they work, unfortunately. Is there any way of hiding backwards? Yeah. You can hide backlinks uh, by blocking all these uh, on the on the link level though. You can't hide it on your own. You can't hide your backlinks by doing something on your side. But if you if you were to own a uh, a link network, private blog network, you could disable Open Site Explorer, Majestic, and all these things on the site level, so all the sites that link to you wouldn't be visible. But that's like a that's a really uh, uh, risky tactic. It still works. There are people, there are providers in, in Brisbane who openly stated using uh, blog networks and, uh, and it works for them. But if you, if you run a serious business, if you have a big brand, that, that's the risk uh, that you wouldn't want to take. So unfortunately, on the site level, there's no way to hide backlinks. Who's next? 
Sure, you've got questions. Um, do you have a tactic for combating referral spam? I've seen people talking about saying, well, I'm not going through that. No. Can you repeat the question? Uh, sorry, um, do I have a tactic for combating referral spam? I, I get referral spam as well. I get link spam, fake, fake links, you know, negative SEO. There's nothing you can do about this. And you can block certain IP addresses. Uh, they just come from different, and I'm just worried that I might block Google by some chance and you know do damage. And yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to combat referral spam. Uh, maybe that's a business idea, you know, the recurring subscription. <laughs> Create a database, a fresh database of all the referral spam, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Okay, so the question, the question is, uh, what if a link to your website is coming from uh, a website that's contextually irrelevant? Um, the main, it can look weird. If it's like a, if, it, if it's a paid sponsorship, it might look weird, but you're probably not gonna get flagged unless you do it on a large scale. Um, if you do a, a few sponsorships, like, it happens on an organic level. You know what I did? I went to Google's link profile, research.google.com, and I found all the, all the places they're sponsored. So whatever page they're sponsored, I've sponsored as well. And I was waiting for them to do something about it, to penalize me, and then I can go, aha, well you bought the links there as well, and I just did the same thing, and you're penalizing me. I was hoping for a story, but it never happened. <laughs> so um, I, think, I think you have to think about it, you know, if somebody from Google's web spam team uh, lands on this page, and if, you, if they review the content, is this gonna seem weird? Um, if the answer is yes, then you're probably better off not, uh, uh, not getting, making that link happen. But if the, if the link happened on its own, it's not your problem. So the, the question, I guess the question is, like, so on a very scale, where would the client have to get that Yeah, that's the recommended. So, uh, the, the best practice is if you're building websites, if you're creating templates, if you're uh, distributing widgets, anything that's sort of automated, mass scale, you know, not, not, uh, if it's not an uh, editorial sort of choice, um, then you're required to put really equals no problem. That's, that's the uh, thing from Google. Um, I wouldn't be worrying about like, uh, small instances, but if you're doing like, web design link at the bottom of, of each client's website, that's something that scales up. So I would sort of I would keep that in a follow-up. I think Google's smart enough to know what a footer link is anyway. A smarter way to get a link from your client's website is to have a contextual page in your client's website that maybe describes the nature of you working together and what's your role as a support of, for that company. Yeah, so a portfolio, a portfolio piece and then linking from blog, that's perfectly fine. And you should, you should be doing that. If you go through so many clients, you should get some extra value. But I suggest being transparent with them about it. Yeah. And just saying that, yeah, you, you sort of, it would help me if you did this. Yeah, and that's fine. <laughs> Any more questions? One up the back from camera. I'll try and get to you quickly. I've got a bad knee. <laughs> suggestions about how to get the best value from press mentions like when our clients mentioned on a newspaper website or something we just put an extract and have a link to them how can we get them to link back to us I, I just uh, I just uh, spoke to uh, uh, one of our clients about this tactic so it all starts with your PR if you if you want to get links from journalists and people writing in the media then you have to create the reason for that link to exist in the first place. And I think why the reason we have PR is to control what the media will say about us, give them some scaffolding to build a story on, right? So what I like to do is, 
within our own PR material, we refer, cleverly refer to a research piece or a study, depending on what, what the PR is about. Say, for example, you know, our company created, uh, it's rolled out a new product, and the adoption rate is 76% as per this report. Then you create that report, put it on your website, and you put links in the PR as a relevant source of information. It's kind of like a proof. And that, that, what that does is gives journalists, oh, okay, well, this will be actually helpful for my reader to, to go and check out this extra information. doesn't always work, but it's the best shot you have. If you, if you email the journalist back and say, can you please link to my website, and then I go, I tried. <laughs> cool, I think we've got time for one more. Uh, who wants the lucky last question? Great talk, Dave. Uh, just one question about the plugin that you wrote that auto expands the text. Um, I think maybe about six months ago, I get a bit vague on time, um, there was chatter, um, I think maybe John Will or someone had said that content and tags that's not there on the page when you start may be devalued. I've never particularly believed that, but I want to get your take on it. I think I may have a slide in my bonus material that talks about this, because it's a question that I get asked a lot. Oh, this is so bad, oh my god. Much yeah, bonus. Don't, don't do that. Um, You'll have to ask him in the happiness bar about all these flash, flash ones. It's, um, it's not in, it's it's not in this, I, I took it out of the slides, but um, essentially I did an experiment. So um, we, had a, we have a client who can't display their content by default. People have to agree that they're a client of theirs and then they can read the content. So it's kind of like a light box style and the, the rest of the page is kind of hidden. Um, so they asked us, you know, will we rank for those keywords that are not visible on the page? Um, we said, well, we don't know. Okay, so we stru structured a test. So we did a test, uh, I think it was four separate tests running, just so we're not like accidentally hitting the result we want. Um, and after maybe two weeks of testing, we found that the keyword that was hidden behind the white box ranked just as well as the uh, keyword that was visible by default on the page. We tested this uh, about three years, ago, three years ago, we tested tabs. So what was hidden behind the tab, will that rank? Yes, it ranked. Um, will it rank better or worse? It doesn't matter. The only actual tangible difference that we found between text hidden behind tab or accordion or whatever and Google's results is that the keyword that you look for, if it's behind a tab or hidden otherwise, is not going to be bolded in the search snippet in Google results. And that's kind of Google saying, well, we're ranking this website for this keyword, but when you land on this page, you're not going to see that keyword on the page. You have to dig for it. So it's just the highlighting matter in the search snippet and no difference whatsoever. That's it. I spoke to John Mueller in um, a couple of months, in, uh, when was that, in uh, uh, March in, in Munich at SMX. And uh, he said that Google may or may not understand when I'm running a test. So if a page looks different than the rest of my site, they might treat that differently. So there are some suspicions around my results, um, that, which means that we'll do a follow-up study. So far, two studies show that there's no absolute, absolute no result. And we see in the wild, things hidden behind uh, tabs do rank. All right, are we out of time? Uh, yeah, we are. So can everyone give Dan a round of applause?